Hi everybody, we've been talking about structure determination and we've been talking uh, recently about mass spectrometry. So, so far you have taken a look at IR spectroscopy which gives you some information about what functional groups are present. So for example in something like hexane, there's not a lot of functional groups. Uh, we have a bunch of CH bonding that's occurring and we see that manifested in uh, this region of the IR which tells us that there's some CH stretches. If we had sp2 or sp hybridized carbons with hydrogens attached to them they would come a slightly different place but we don't in an alkane so we don't see anything in that region of the spectrum. We see something here it's not really particularly informative uh, but we do see that due to the CH bonding as well and there's some things in here due to CC bonding. Not very informative uh, we do get lots more information when we have more functionalized molecules, but in the case of alkanes, we would get a little bit more information from a mass spec. The mass spec gives us the actual molecular mass from which we can determine a uh, empirical molecular, I'm sorry, uh, a, a molecular mass we can use to determine potential possible uh, molecular formulas. Uh, and we can see that in the mass spec because we knock an electron out uh, in the kind of mass spec we've been talking about that causes uh, the molecule to become a new kind of molecule a radical cation and it breaks apart and the way it breaks apart tells us a little bit more about the structure so something like hexane for example breaks apart and gives different fragments than if we were to have something like 2-methylpentane which would be uh, exactly the same it's IR would look very similar, but its mass spec would look uh, quite a bit different. So between those two, we would be able to nail down the structure. I want to talk to you today about another technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. It's a much more powerful technique. So let's take a look at that. Uh, as you'll, I, I want to remind you about this website that you'll may that you'll want to look at when you think you know the structure or something. Uh, that you've uh, determined by looking at the different kinds of spectra, it's a good idea to go to this place and you can see that you will find actual uh, spectra for the exact molecule that you uh, think you have and you'll be able to compare them to see if you're right. Uh, that's important as well. So nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy gives us information about uh, particular nuclei. So if we take a look at uh, this molecule, codeine, we see over here we can generate two different kinds of spectra. Uh, we could actually generate even more, but we can take a look at the hydrogens. We do that with this, uh, what we call proton NMR spectroscopy. We could also take a look at the carbon by using something called C13 uh, spectroscopy. Uh, so there's a lot of information here right now that just looks like a bunch of lines on a page to you hopefully after a few of these videos you'll begin to see how you can gain information about your molecule uh, and the different isotopes in it so we're going to be focusing at first on the hydrogen nuclei in our sample uh, Again, it's a very powerful technique and we can tell very small differences in structure by looking at the different spectra. Uh, so we'd be able to discern all of these uh, different derivatives of codeine if we had their NMR spectrums, spectra. And we can tell that this particular spectra, uh, if we were very good at it, we'd be able to look at these two spectra and probably come up with uh, the structure or something very close. The important part about nuclear magnetic resonance is that we use the nuclei uh, of, uh, we're going to talk about hydrogen, so nuclei can have a magnetic moment. If they have this property known as nuclear spin, uh, all elementary particles, that is protons, neutrons, and electrons, do have spin. But an individual atom may or may not have spin. It depends on the net sum of the vectors in the atoms uh, of that nuclei. Some nuclei do have 
spin and because they have spin they have a magnetic moment that's the important the important part so if our hydrogen nuclei have spin which h1 hydrogen does we're going to be looking at the nuclei of hydrogen that only have a proton in it we also have hydrogen that have a proton and a neutron in them that's known as h2 2 hydrogen but we usually just call it deuterium okay so we're going to be focusing on hydrogen that only has a proton in it because of as net spin it has a net magnetic moment and these things act like tiny bar magnets that in itself here we could imagine where we have a bunch of of hydrogen nuclei with just one proton and they have this net spin they thus have a magnetic moment but that doesn't do very much until we apply a strong external magnetic field that's what we mean by this b naught sometimes you'll see it the magnetic field is represented by h naught uh, often it'll depend if you're a chemist or a physicist but uh we're going to use b naught most of the time so once we apply this external magnetic field that causes all of those tiny little magnets, bar magnets, to line up. They can line up in one of two ways. They can line up uh, with the externally applied magnetic field, or they can line up oops, against the external field, the applied external field. So what what good is that as it turns out uh i'll come back to this slide as it turns out those two different spin states the alpha spin state the alpha spin state which is aligned with the applied magnetic field and the beta spin state which is applied uh, which is lined up against the applied magnetic field have slightly different energies and we can probe those energies. Uh, remember, what spectroscopy does is uh, it just looks at the energy separation. This amount of energy is actually uh, corresponds to electromagnetic energy in the radio frequency range. So we can probe these by using uh, either we will introduce a photon with the exact right energy to that corresponds to this energy difference and if we were to do that we can flip the spin state if we put the energy into an alpha spin that exactly corresponds to this energy difference we will promote it to the beta spin and we can see that that energy has been absorbed alternatively we could look at molecules that were in the beta spin and they're actually going to relax uh, things always try to find a lower energy state and when these find a lower energy state they will emit a pro a photon of the exact energy that corresponds to this energy difference so that's actually what we do in modern nmr experiments in early NMR and these instruments still do exist we call them continuous wave we do the opposite we actually promote the alpha spin states and look at the energy that's absorbed in what we call a Fourier transform pulsed magnetic spectrometer we excite all of them and we watch them decay and as they decay they emit photons that's going to be dependent on that separation between the energy states so when we do an NMR experiment, uh, we have to use a solvent. If we're looking at uh, protons, hydrogen atoms with just protons in reality, and we call this proton NMR spectrometry, nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry, we can't have any hydrogen atoms uh, with just a proton uh, in 
our solvent molecules. We want to use a solvent that doesn't have any hydrogen. We replace the hydrogens with deuterium. This is a common NMR solvent, deuterated chloroform, because it's cheap and uh, it has no hydrogens. We've replaced the hydrogen. So we put our samples in a strong magnetic field uh, and that lines them up either for or against. What we then do is we give it a pulse of radio energy and we excite all of the nuclei in the sample. Then when those atoms relax, they emit energy in the form of a radio wave electromagnetic photons. And we can watch how they decay. Uh, we get out of this experiment something called a free induction decay. We'll see that in just a second. So we want to be aware a little bit of what's actually happening. When we put them in a magnetic field, uh, they get in these individual spin states. And it doesn't matter if they're uh, spin up or they could also be spin down. But the important thing is that... Uh, they align up, they don't exactly line up, and they process around the axis of our applied magnetic field. We call that the z-axis. Uh, and they process around that with a certain frequency. That's the frequency of uh, the photon that we have to use to uh, either flip them or that gets emitted when they when they flip. So uh, if we have the alpha state and we put the exact precession frequency photon into them, they will absorb and they will flip and make the beta st spin state. Alternatively, what we do is we excite everything so that they're all excited. And when they go back the other way, they emit a photon, which we can detect. And that's how we get our information. The nucleus is said to be in resonance with the incoming electromagnetic radiation. They have to have the same frequency. That precession frequency has to have the same frequency that corresponds to the electromagnetic radiation that we put in. And then afterwards, we watch it come out. It'll be slightly different. So we don't really need to know all the specifics of the experiment. You'll get that in a course in your third year. Uh, so we get this free induction to con decay, it contains all the information for each of the atoms in our sample. We then use a mathematical uh, equation, a Fourier transform, to convert our signals from the time domain into the frequency domain. Uh, so don't worry too much about that. But let's take a look at what happens. At this point, we've, we pulse our spectrometer, we excite everything, and then we watch this decay. This is our free induction decay here. Okay. And we watch how they decay. Uh, we're monitoring uh, at a certain frequency. And we're monitoring that decay as a function of time. And every uh, nuclei will have a different relaxation time so that we see this kind of wavy decay pattern. If every nuclei in there were the same, our, de our decay would be a perfect decay like this. But they're different. There's many different uh, nuclei in there. We then use this Fourier transform to convert our time domain into the frequency domain. And this tells us the frequency at which the individual protons uh, emit. So what this is telling me now is that my sample, whatever my sample is, has three different kinds of protons in them that admit at slightly different frequencies. That's what this is down here is, is a, a frequency. And we 
fish that out of this free induction decay. So it is the reading of this graph that will give us the information we need to take a look at the sample. So why do these different uh, nuclei have different uh, decay frequencies? Well, it's because what happens when we excite them, we have this applied external field that we've put them in, okay? When we put our nuclei in this applied ex magnetic field, uh, they line up with or against the magnetic field, but that external magnetic field is going to cause the electrons around our protons to circulate uh, in the direction according to the uh, left-handed rule uh, for magnetic, and you'll learn about that in physics. That motion of the electron, when, whenever we have an electron that's moving, a charged particle that's moving, uh, it will produce a magnetic field. We call this the induced magnetic field. Okay, This magnetic field now is different than the external magnetic field. This magnetic field becomes comes about because of that circulating uh, electrons uh, that are circulating in this fashion. And at the nuclei, that is going to, that external magnetic field is going to oppose it. So this is our applied magnetic field. And we talk about this. This little vector right here is our induced magnetic field. So the actual magnetic field that the proton feels is a combination of the two of those. It's the effective magnetic field. And because that induced magnetic field is going to be dependent on the electron density around that nuclei, every nuclei that will be different if it's in a different chemical environment. So let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. And here we're going to imagine that we have methane, okay? So all of the hydrogen and the carbons have some electrons around the nuclei. If we replace one of the hydrogens with a chlorine, chlorines are very electronegative, and they're going to suck some of that electron density away from both the carbons and the hydrogens. So these hydrogens have lower electron density than these hydrogens. So the induced magnetic field is slightly less because there's less electron density around them. If we replaced another hydrogen atom with another chlorine atom, these would be even more de-shielded, or there's less electron density around these hydrogens than both of these. So the induced magnetic field is even smaller for these. So if we take a look at the magnetic field that is felt by the proton, remember it's a combination of the applied external magnetic field and the induced magnetic field, which is going in the opposite direction. So if we have a lot of electron density, that induced magnetic field is going to be fairly large. If we have little electron density, that induced magnetic field is going to be less. So the V effective is going to be dependent. So the ones that have lots of electron density, we say that they're, uh, the protons are shielded because there's lots of electrons around them. They have a small be effective, a small uh, effective magnetic field. Those that are de-shielded because we're pulling electron density away and there's less electron density around the nuclei feel a greater beta effective. So the frequency of the photons that are emitted from the excited states are going to be different and we can monitor that. And all of that information comes out of, sorry, where was my, no, here we see that. So this is the region where our atoms are highly shielded, and these are de-shielded. The 
that give us different signals. And because of that, we can tell that uh, these have more electronegative groups attached to them. For some reason, there's less electron density around those nuclei. Okay, so the next video, we'll take a look at what this looks like when we take a look at some spectra.